All right, uh, morning everyone. Um, welcome to A16C Crypto Research Seminar. Um, part two, Proof of Stick Blockchains by our own Dara Nikolenko. From Tuesday, we know about kind of like a general lands the general landscape, and then today's just gonna drill down into long range attacks and some other issues, so. Thanks, Tim. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, today we're gonna deep dive into one particular attack on proof of stake blockchains that's not possible in proof of work blockchain. And uh, that's, I guess, in my view, the hardest attack to combat. And there are different approaches and we'll see different trade-offs that they offer. And maybe if there's time at the end, we can have a little bit of brainstorming. Maybe you guys have other ideas of how this can be mitigated. Um, but yeah, we'll start with the definition again of the long range attack, just to remind you, I will not redefine the proof of stake, hope everybody kind of has the mental model in mind. And then I will discuss different mitigation approaches. So proof of stake um, blockchains that are typically proved um, to be safe when a threshold of validating nodes um, is honest. And when you violate this threshold, then you lose safety. And then you can create forks and, and double spend on these forks. So um, you break the finality guarantee when, you, um, when the number of Byzantine validators kind of go over threshold. And um, when I will be talking about corrupting a validator or corrupting a validating node, what I will mean is corrupting a signing key of that node. So when I'm saying a node, just think about a signing key. Corrupting a node is corrupting its signing key. Uh, so during the time that validator is active and participating in um, kind of producing blocks for consensus, it has some stake locked. And in case of a deviation from the protocol, if it is observable, typically uh, you can slash the validator stake. So um, get it penalized for misbehaving, for not following the protocol, and causing the blockchain to fork effectively. So for Ethereum 2.0, for example, slashing conditions can, can be very harsh. So for Ethereum consensus layer, slash validator can lose um, potentially its, his own deposit. So three to 100%. Um, it will immediately forcibly be ejected from the validator set and will additionally has the remainder of his coins locked uh, for 36 days before they can withdraw, if there are any coins left, if he wasn't uh, slashed completely. So validators have really, really strong incentives to stay honest while they're validating. And there's even some lockup period after they stopped validating to make sure that if they were misbehaving while they were validating, somebody have enough time to kind of collect this data and maybe present it back to the protocol to get their stake slashed. In, in any case. So there is a little bit of window when the stake continues to be locked, but the validator is not validating the chain anymore. So it's just idling there. Lockup periods can vary. For example, for Ethereum, it's one day. Uh, the stake is continues to be locked, and for co but we've seen lar much larger lockup periods. For Cosmos, for example, it's 21 days that the stake continues to be locked. So the high level idea of all of that is that uh, active validators, they stay honest due to incentives if the protocol is designed well. And let's look at kind of the lifetime of a validator. So a validator will have to hold some assets on the blockchain to be able to lock them up to participate in the consensus. There will be some period when he holds some assets on the blockchain. Then there will be some period when he staked these assets to indicate that he is willing to participate as a validating node. Typically, there is a window before, before he is let into the validator set. Um, for example, Ethereum kind of does some speed limiting of how many validators can join at a time. So they create some queue, and you're waiting in this queue to start validating. So they want to make sure that the validating set is not changing drastically um, in an instant. So you will have gradual increase and gradual decrease, kind of down, some dumpering of the size. So the stake period is a subset of uh, the holding asset period, and then the validating period is even smaller. But the validator has, even if he was holding some assets in the past, as time kind of progresses, he can just exit the chain completely. He can use an exchange and just uh, get rid of all of his assets and kind of not be incentivized in this blockchain anymore. 
So after he sold his assets and exited the blockchain, there are essentially no incentives for the Svalbard to keep his old keys that were kind of guarding all of the stake uh, secure. So when there's no incentives... Um, so you ask a question on that? Yeah. So those keys are going to be different, the staking keys and the validating keys, or could they be the same? Or Yeah, typically they're different. Yeah, good question. Um, so the typically there's not three different keys. All the staking... All right, so, the, so sorry, the first key is just like your normal, you know, private key for your account, I guess, yeah, for the, right. to move the assets around. Mm -hmm. And you're saying, so the staking key will be used only to like withdraw your stake or it has other uses? To withdraw your stake, exactly. Okay. Yeah, so you will kind of sign with this key, you will sign your staking key, and then, well, effectively through transactions, and then sign kind of validating consensus key. Right, so you're saying you'll cast votes and it says it's worked well using your validating key. Yes, exactly right. right. So you, you can compromise either the asset key and then you will be compromising the stake and the validating key or you can be compromising the validating key alone and just causing disruption to consensus. Yeah, great question. We'll discuss keys uh, a lot. Um, so if all validators become corrupt, then safety can be violated as well. It's not only that the active validators, you need to corrupt the active validators to break safety. You can also corrupt historical validators. So for example, if your chain was um, growing nicely um, and was not forking, or at least was not, didn't have any deep forks, it can certainly for Nakamoto consensus, it can be forking at the deep, but usually the longest chain wins, so you don't have uh, kind of deep forks. So if your chain was growing nicely, everybody was staying honest, but then at some point, maybe these validators who were finalizing one of the blocks or epochs uh, just exited the system completely and then sold their keys to the attacker, and the attacker now kind of got hold of all of those uh, consensus keys. It can, although this is a point in the past, it can still create a, like, an alternative block and due to costless simulation of proof of stake blockchain, kind of continue this work onwards and uh, grow it very fast so that it's about the same length as the honest chain. And the poor user who was not online, was not following, maybe he just entered the blockchain, he cannot differentiate between the two forks. Or at least the attacker has the potential to make it indistinguishable from the top one. Uh, let's see. Let's kind of discuss the keys a little bit. So you can kind of map the number of validating keys depending on time, and your blockchain can at certain times have a lot of validators validating. Sometimes it will drop. And so, of course, when the number of validators is really low, that's a kind of nice point for that attacker to try to collect all of that keys. Um, typically, the blockchains have low number of validators in the beginning, so till it catches up. But sometimes it can have kind of drops in the number of keys as it goes. All right, so hope that gives you a high level idea. And uh, we will discuss um, now mitigations for this problem. So I will show you five different approaches. And then maybe we can brainstorm if, if there are ideas on more stuff to explore. Um, so the first is the most simplest one, is checkpointing. So the idea is that you have some centralized uh, checkpointing mechanism. And for example, uh, you can hardcore the checkpoint, checkpoint being just the hash of the block. So it's super small, it doesn't have to be the whole state of the blockchain, it can just be commitment to that state, like a hash of the block. So you can hardcore the checkpoint into the GitHub code base, for example. And when everybody is downloading that GitHub code base and they're using it to synchronize to the blockchain, the GitHub just, the code base will just uh, kind of figure out which chain you need uh, to pick if there are any deep forks in there. So for example, Genesis is hard coded into the GitHub of uh, all the clients. And uh, oh, you think maybe this is an undesirable kind of, because it's centralized. But if you look at the kind of blockchains today, it's kind of pretty centralized in terms of what clients everybody, client is, everybody is using. For execution client, the most popular is Geth. 
and it's taking about 83-84% of the total nodes. So 80% of nodes are running Git client from the GitHub. And for consensus clients, they, most of them are using Prism, so 60% of them. And that's data from January 2022. Um, and another idea of what you can do with the checkpointing is you can checkpoint to a proof of work blockchain, of course. And then uh, there you don't have the problem of it being susceptible to long, long range attacks. So if you put your checkpoint there, you can be sure it will not be rewarded by some deep fork. Um, and actually, uh, some of the projects, even not related to blockchain, are using proof of work chains to checkpoint uh, their stuff um, to put some hashes in, under their accounts. Yeah, so the problem is uh, kind of the top approach is kind of centralized because you um, rely on the fact that everybody will be downloading the client that ha all the clients will have the same checkpoint. So you either have a centralized place to download your client or the clients still have to consent on what check which checkpoints should be there. Um, and of course, the other uh, approach has a problem that it's proof of work blockchain. The whole point of proof of stake is to get rid of proof of work. So kind of it's a, you're back to the original problem you were trying to solve, which is not great. So are there any existing systems which do this? Like I think only as a precaution, not like as a main part of the protocol. But so some do do as a, as a problem? Well, actually, I'm not 100% sure that like for the DM blockchain, we're thinking of doing it because it's... Bitcoin, well, Bitcoin did it for a very long time, but they removed it in 2016, 2017. And so what, what, how did they implement? What was the... It was just exactly like this. It was just in Bitcoin core client. They just had a line to say, this hash should be in the blockchain. Good. So it's the Genesis block and then they have some other yeah. things too. So. Yeah, I think what they have is like maybe six or seven different checkpoints at all time mm -hmm. before they eventually moved it mm -hmm. because it was centralized. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, also if there is a hard fork then uh, and you want your client to follow one of them, you'll have to put a checkpoint in there so that it synchronizes to the correct fork. Um, yeah, so Joe's understanding is that checkpointing exists more as a social convention rather than an automated protocol step. Right. Yeah, good point. I, I don't know if that was clear what I wrote. I'm cutting a little out of it. But yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of, as my understanding anyway, I've seen some projects that they don't have like a sort of an automated checkpointing system, but they sort of like manually put them in code or, uh, you know, like clients enforce them anyway. And they're sort of established by some undefined like human level protocol basically which i think is mostly because people don't want to sort of admit that this is what they're doing <laughs> <laughs> yeah great comment thanks joe yeah <laughs> uh okay let's discuss the second approach for a key evolving cryptography so it's a good practice for validators and, and essentially for everybody on the blockchain to kind of rotate their keys once in a while um, because the attacker can kind of be slowly crawling to get your key there and if you rotate it, you kind of push the attacker back. Um, also, uh, yeah, but you need to be careful because the moment you wrote this time when you rotate your key, you make yourself a little bit vulnerable to attack. Um, so rotate, I mean, um, you have, you sign a transaction that basically moves you from this key to a fresh key. Yeah, you just change the key, yeah. Right, and as, uh, let's see, like, if, say, the set of validators are, is growing, and at some point you have, you're compromising, say, two validators out of a big set, then although you cannot attack the chain at this point, if validators were not rotating their keys, uh, that immediately means that you're compromising the validators from the sets prior to that. So if at some point you start getting, uh, say, two thirds of validators compromised, then that's the point when you can start forking the blockchain. So although it seems like you're not compromising uh, enough, like if, if the validators were keeping the same keys, compromising them for the last epoch, 
uh, is essentially the same as compromising them for some previous epoch where you would have a super majority of them compromised and can fork. So the, to mitigate that, like people were pr proposing to use uh, key evolving cryptography. So, and you will rely on the assumption that honest nodes will regularly rotate their keys and honestly forget the old ones. So you can either do this with on-chain transactions when you sign a transaction directly that uh, kind of moves you from uh, public key one to public key two and secret key two is completely independent of secret key one. But if that's expensive, if uh, you don't want to submit a transaction, pay the fees for every key rotation, you can use some clever tricks uh, around time evolving secret keys. Um, and the, the team from Algorand uh, was proposing the pixel signatures. The idea there is the public key stays the same, so you don't need to rotate it because only the public key is there on chain, so the public key is the same. But the secret key kind of is evolving with time. So uh, with every epoch number, you're kind of shaving a little bit of information from your secret key so that it, it starts to be more and more restrictive. Uh, and you cannot go backwards. So your secret key one is the most powerful. From that, you can evolve all the next ones. But you, from secret key two, say you cannot go backwards and figure out what was the secret key one. And the signature that you verify, it also will take an index i. So you cannot produce, um, say, sigma one using secret key two. That will not be possible. No. So you cannot kind of go back and compromise, kind of forge sigma one using secret key two. So that's a very nice trick. I know they were proposing to use it at Algorand. I don't know if they ended up using it. It's kind of um, quite elaborate scheme. It involves some um, hierarchical identity-based encryption based on DLS signatures. But anyway, that's a nice approach. If you're not comfortable with the kind of complicated cryptography, you can always just uh, ask your validators to rotate the key frequently. Okay, so the problem, of course, with this approach is um, it's incentive incompatible. So why would honest validators forget their old keys? If, um, you know, if there is incentive for them to keep the old keys and then when they exit the system, kind of sell these old keys to the adversary, then it's unlike, well, it's a little bit maybe naive to expect all of them to behave honestly and just keep forgetting information, especially since you cannot check whether they forgot the information or not. I mean, the way I think about it is it may actually be a little bit of a pain to truly delete old keys. It's just it's, that yeah. it's not so much that they want to keep them, it's just like they don't want to put in the effort to make sure that they don't keep them. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Like, even if you like wipe out the memory, how can you be sure that? It's been wiped out. There is an argument for why you would want to erase your old keys, which uh, I haven't seen made very widely, but I think it's pretty simple. If people believe that you're erasing your old keys, then you're not a target. It's kind of like when you park in San Francisco and open your glove box to show that there's nothing to steal. Because uh, if people break into your system to steal your old Algorand key, they might steal other stuff too. You probably have like pooled things um so like if you don't want to attack the system there's there isn't an, like at least some incentive if you can convince other people you've erased your old keys because then they're then you're not a target yeah i guess the question is how would you convince somebody that you've erased it how can how in your analogy kind of how do you show that you have nothing in the trunk of yeah your, uh, i mean that is i mean like fundamentally we don't really have any way to do it like you, you could do it using SGX or something like that. Uh, but yeah, there isn't like a cryptographic way to prove you've deleted anything. Yeah, yeah. And interesting. Yeah, good point that SGX can help if you willing to rely on your trusted hardware assumptions. Okay, so that's the second idea and it kind of is not perfect as well. So. Um, the other idea is uh, how about we keep everybody online? And if everybody is online all the time, kind of checks in with the chain very frequently, there is no way you, you're gonna uh, 
uh, fool them into believing some deep fork because they've been just following the correct fork all the way. Um, so for the example, Ethereum consensus layer, which is a combination of Casper finality gadgets and LMD ghost fork selection rule that I was describing in the last talk, in their paper, they also discussed long range attack and that's exactly kind of the approach that they propose. And the paper, just to cite them, they say in the paper, each client will log on and gain a complete up-to-date view of the chain at some regular frequency, say once uh, per one to two months. So that's a very strong assumption to swallow, right? Because there can be clients who never been active on Ethereum, but who want to join, like they need to figure out what's the correct chain, or at least maybe who are the active clients who've been monitoring this chain. And then you're back to the same problem. Um, yeah, so the problem is that clients can be sleepy and you still want to give them some way to sync to the correct chain, even if they were sleepy. Um, okay, the, so the fourth approach is finality gadgets of Nakamoto consensus. Um, so the Casper FFG here is the finality gadget. Um, and some people kind of think that they help with long range attacks somehow, but I'll explain what they do and you'll see that um, uh, they, they're solving a different problem actually. So the examples of fin kind of some prominent finality gadgets is of course Ethereum consensus layer, which is Casper finality gadget, um, and Grandpa, that's a finality gadget on top of Polkadot. Uh, Nakamoto consensus. So the idea is uh, to use validator committees to vote on epochs to finalize them. So you'll be just running a committee-based uh, BFT chain on top of your longest chain um, to guarantee deterministic finality. So uh, Casper, yeah, let's look at Casper protocol. Very briefly, I'll, like, desc I'll describe the high-level idea. Um, it's based on Tendermint. Although maybe reading it, it's kind of hard to figure out what, what this consensus protocol is, but it's essentially tender um, each So in LMD Ghost, in the underlying Nakamoto consensus, you have each validator vote once per epoch. So validators are shuffled into committees, and uh, in each slot, a leader is proposing a block, and the committee of that slot is voting for the block. So validator is assigned to exactly be a member of one committee. He can be at most one leader um, there. So, so sorry, he can be assigned to a committee and then he can be selected as a leader from that committee or not. So in any case, he is voting once per epoch. And Casper, so it's voting on that block. And Casper, in addition to that voting, it asks the validator also to vote on the previous epochs. So you are trying to finalize the previous epochs and together with voting on your current block, you'll also be voting on what are the epochs that you believe should be finalized. So each validator will be submitting two votes. These are essentially Tendermint votes. If you remember how Tendermint works, one vote will be uh, saying that I want to finalize this epoch in, in um, kind of in form of a prepare phase of the Tendermint and the some previous epoch that already collected a quorum certificate of prepare votes to commit it. So just to remind you, can the Tendermint has this three stages where the, the block is proposed and this block proposition, proposition in our case is epoch proposition and that's happening from the underlying consensus layer. So the consensus sorry, the underlying uh, Nakamoto consensus. It proposes an epoch to finalize, and then all validators kind of vote in two stages. They submit their prepare votes and commit votes. Just the difference uh, here is that it's a different committee that is voting on the epochs. So uh, this committee, um, this last committee here, is voting on epoch I plus one, and then the committee after that one will be casting a second vote on this epoch. So you are changing the committees that are voting. Uh, so this is just a nice pipelining um, idea that they had, but actually I think the Casper paper is from 2017, at least when they had the original idea. And um, that's why it's kind of very similar to Tendermint. But I don't think maybe they've 
reconsidered. Maybe there is a way of, of just thinking to simplify the protocol with ideas that um, appeared in hot stuff, because hot stuff was later. And hot stuff has this really nice pipelining of, uh, of voting so that maybe you don't need to vote twice, you can just vote once. And this kind of help, helps you confirm all the previous epochs. So anyway, uh, I don't know, maybe there is a way for improvement there for Casper Protocol to simplify their voting mechanism. All right, but you see that uh, still uh, you have this problem that if the committee, if the old committee is compromised, your BFT gadget does not guarantee you safety. So you can still fork the epoch voting and create an alternative fork of epochs. So you have to rely on the committee staying kind of honest in perpetuity so you're back to the same problem. So overall, I just want to say that this is this are great ideas, and um, but they solve a different problem. So it, these gadgets are turning probabilistic finality into deterministic finality, but it doesn't solve the long-range attack. Yeah, and then the rest of the talk, I will spend kind of describing the paper that we wrote with Sarah Zubi and George Danezes when we were working on the DM blockchain was called, no, uh, yeah, it was called different names, but DM was the last one. Um, so we were exactly tr trying to figure out if there are better ways to prevent long range attacks. Um, and the idea that we had and that kind of summarizes Winkle in one sentence is make users vote inside their transactions on the current state of the blockchain. So you not only have kind of validators voting your BFT consensus, and DM was BFT consensus, but you also make the users who participate in the system also participate in your consensus. So we'll see how it plays out. Uh, it will be easiest for me to describe the protocol uh, on top of BFT consensus that has deterministic finality, um, but you can this doesn't have to apply to BFT consensus only. It can also apply to a BFT consensus that's a finality gadget on top of Nakamoto. So you, you can add this on top, of, um, on top of your finality gadget, for example, if you have a Nakamoto consensus underneath. Or you can maybe adapt Winkle to directly, vote, uh, directly work with Nakamoto consensus, but we haven't done that. Since DM was a BFT blockchain, so we're focusing only on BFT uh, blockchain. So, um, yeah, let's start from the beginning. So, blockchain is you start with Genesis and then you produce uh, blocks of transactions. Your um, block is the parent hash of the previous block and the list of transactions. And then validators kind of work to s finalize this um, block. And at the end, they get some certificate that it's, uh, think of it as an aggregate signature that is a proof that they have all consented. Uh, to, to, to append this block to the uh, blockchain. And the single block commits to the full history up to gen Genesis because it contains the parent hash, so it has this nice chain. Uh, but for the purpose of this talk, we will be focusing on epochs instead of blocks. Um, so when I show you this rectangle with a list of transactions, think of uh, an epoch of transactions. Because anyway, the BFT um, blockchain orders all of the transactions totally. So you can just think about uh, these blocks as epochs. So validators work on finalizing the next epoch of transactions. And they stay honest when active. So the typical BFT assumption is that you have uh, 3F plus 1 validators, and at most, F can be crapped. So validators kind of uh, figure out if they want to consent on this block, and the end they produce a certificate, they move to the next block or epoch, and they, so that's how they evolve the chain. Uh, so yeah, and, and, well, well, think of validators not arising epochs here. So validators are effectively just a set of public signature verification keys, as I was saying, and this certificate is an aggregate signature. And validators are typically implied by the previous epoch. So you, so validators not arising the first epoch are retrieved from the genesis. So the genesis will just define, okay, this is the first set of validators that we're going to start with. And then from the previous epoch, you retrieve kind of the next set of validators that we'll be finalizing. So 
validators to finalize E2 are retrieved from E1 epoch and so on. And to finalize E3, you need to retrieve validators from E2. Uh, yeah, and I was explaining in the beginning that if everybody is honest, uh, you have a single chain, but if validators, um, past validators are corrupted, they can fork and create an alternative chain that will totally confuse the user about which is the correct one. So we will, I will oversimplify a little bit, and that's what we do in the paper. Uh, in that we view transactions that are simple money transfers, and uh, that makes the overall model much simpler. But it can be adjusted to work with um, more elaborate transactions as well. So the transaction will be just of the form of the sender, a receiver, and the amount, and um, signature will be a signature of the sender on this triple. So Genesis block assumes it gives some um, initial allocation of coins uh, between the accounts. And an epoch of valid transaction modifies this allocation, right? So if you have transactions that sends uh, one coin from Alice to Bob, signed by Alice, you, the, your next state of the database will be that Alice will have one coin less and Bob will have two, one coin mo more. And uh, yeah, so you process just transactions sequentially, kind of redistributing the coins uh, between accounts. Okay, this is oversimplification, of course. Uh, most of the blockchain have some scripting or programming language that makes it a little bit more complicated than this model, but we'll be focusing on this model just to understand the high level idea. So let's see what the corrupt validators may do. Uh, so when they have corrupted the validator set and they're trying to create an alternative fork, what they cannot absolutely do is they cannot forge signatures from honest accounts. So if you were, uh, for example, if you had your funds um, in Genesis and you were not moving them anywhere and you still keep your uh, account key to yourself, the adversary will not be able to suddenly steal your funds. Um, so it can not forge transactions from honest users, but it can definitely censor, it can drop transactions of honest users, and for itself it can double spend, it can um, create new transactions from corrupt accounts. So it's uh, kind of good if you are idle then, and not transacting, then the attacker will not be able to do anything, to do much with you. But if you're, say, a big exchange, and all the time you would have a lot of money coming in and a lot of money coming out, and this happening in every epoch, then the attacker can just attack your exchange by censoring all the transactions that were coming in. And so it will very quickly, in his alternative work, kind of deplete uh, all of your funds, all of the funds of the exchange. So the idea is, uh, to change the, um, the whole idea of Winkle is to change the transaction format and to also ask users to vote on the last epoch. That's sort of a natural thing I feel to do. I'm a little bit surprised that none of the blockchains kind of thinking about doing that, but it definitely will kind of involve a little bit more work on the validator side because now they will need to make sure that the last epoch that the transaction is voting on it conforms kind of um, with, the, with the fork at which you are finalizing the transaction. So you need to make sure that the transactions in the epoch are voting on some epoch that was there on this chain, on the same chain. Um, so when the transaction additionally kind of has this last epoch, it will be voting with the sender account on this epoch. So be like a second layer of consensus or voting happening where users themselves, by just transacting on the blockchain, will be voting on the state of the blockchain. So it's a little bit kind of uh, maybe hard to implement because it will also involve um, changes to account states. For example, if you are a receiver and you're receiving uh, money with different votes, you need to kind of to keep track which of your coins have been voting for which epochs. And so as a result, the coins will sort of 
have a non-fungibility uh, flavor, start having this non-fungibility flavor, and that some coins will be voting for one epoch and some coins will be voting for other epochs. So just to give an example here, suppose um, there are three accounts, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. Each of them has one coin, and this coin is voting on some first epoch, E0. Then if the transaction moves coins from Bob to Charlie, say from Bob to Charlie, one coin moves, and uh, its vote is E1. Then the coin moving to Charlie will now be stored in Charlie account, but it will have a different vote from the other coin that Charlie has. And then if Alice Bob sends Bob one coin, it will also get the vote uh, on the coin updated. Is there a yes. Um, I think in the first one, I think Solana does something like this. It's called proof of history. And so in your transaction, you can even make the block hash or whatever of the previous block. So uh, I, think, so I think they do so. I don't know if they use it for consensus, but they're doing something along these lines. Interesting. So they're using, okay. they call it the history. I thought it was really weird when I looked at it, but maybe it doesn't make more sense. Uh -huh. um, the second question was what happens if Alice sends coin to herself? So in that sense, you know, Alice sends to another account that belongs to her. Does yeah, that she, mean? She can update her vote this way. Yeah, yeah, so in that way, she's sort of just, uh, you know, voting, but it doesn't cost her any money to do that. Yeah, exactly. Right. Have you considered using transaction fees for this? So the more transaction fees you pay is you're the weight of your vote. Uh, say it again, so you will be depleting out of oh, my sorry, so here my that. understanding is that if I send one coin to Charlie, that one coin is sort of used for the vote. Yes. No, no, actually, sorry, maybe I wasn't explaining it right, but the whole account of a sender will get the um, their coins updated. Oh, so the whole, like, yeah, the whole sender, Charlie has all the 100 coins. And yeah. only sends one to Charlie, her all 100 coins will get updated to that vote. Okay. So she kind of, every so time she, yeah, every time she sends a transaction, she kind of votes on the, okay. with all, all of her stake. Have you considered using transaction fees so there's a, like a, a cost to be to do that? So instead of using your balance, you could just use, maybe if you have to pay a dollar as a transaction fee to the validators, mm -hmm. then you can add a real cost to your vote. Oh, yes, you think of lowering transaction fees as if the only thing you're doing is just updating the vote? What I mean is that like, right now the vote is weighted by the balance. Yeah. Have you considered the vote just being the, the quality of transaction fees that they pay? Oh, but that will be lower than the balance. Well, it just means that it costs them money to vote. Because right now it doesn't cost them anything to vote, necessarily. Well, you still have the transaction fees, right? Oh, you're saying that the more transaction fees you pay, the kind of the stronger your vote is? Yeah, exactly. I don't know if you can say that it's just what I heard. Yeah, maybe that's a good idea, like to express how strongly you believe uh, the chain. Um, yeah, we haven't ex explored that, but the worry there is, the, I don't know, maybe, uh, I'm not sure many users will be willing to pay transaction fees to kind of strongly express their vote. They would rather probably... Well, I just because well, we're sort of doing this anyway, so Ethereum, they pay $10 million a day or something on fees. Uh, so there's like $10 million of votes you would get as well. Yeah. Yeah, but I just thought I'd recommend it. Maybe it's a good uh-huh, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Yeah, it's funny, it's almost like, like we have 59 basically transaction fees would turn into this kind of non-transferable governance token yeah. effect. You know I mean? so, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. Can I, can I ask, maybe I'll get to this, but what, why it doesn't a long-range attack apply for these types of votes too? Because like... Uh, Seems like people making transactions when, once they've once they're not using their keys anymore, they can also be compromised, right? Yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely right. I'm gonna talk about that next. So the, uh, just to maybe briefly uh, briefly say that uh, the stake of the overall system is of course prote protected by many many more keys than you have on the validator side, and so the argument, of course, that you are not like solving the problem completely, you're just making it better so that more keys are protecting now the blockchain, um, not just validator's keys, but now also the user's keys. Uh, but I'll get to that with some numbers. That's a good point. Yeah, um, yeah so 
coins will be voting on epoch so if you consider the state of the accounts on your last epoch you will just see what the coins are voting on kind of retrospectively and you will see which and the, the, uh, this transitive like if you if um, a coin is voting on an epoch after um, after the book that you're interested in, you, you will also count its vote towards the previous one. So, kind of, if you're voting on some um, subsequent epoch, it kind of transitively translates to the voting on all of the previous chain. So, you will see which of the epochs gets about two thirds of the votes. And this threshold is flexible. We are showing that maybe it doesn't have to be two thirds, depending on the assumption that you want to have. But you can also go with BFT assumptions um, and uh, consider the checkpoint finalized if it's uh, voted by two thirds of uh, coins according to the state of the accounts on the last epoch. Cool. So essentially, we are kind of showing a security theorem saying that if the adversary has a max F fraction of stake to begin with, and that's the accounts that it has compromised and can double spend from, and at maximum some S stake moves within an epoch, and then if, if you can bound the, this F plus S over two um, by one third, then you can prove that the adversary cannot accumulate more than two thirds of stake to create a checkpoint on the fork. So for a user to see which chain is the correct one, it will kind of observe the chain for a while, and if it's not producing any checkpoints, or if, it's, uh, if it doesn't have any checkpoints at all, and the last, uh, in the last interval that's sufficiently big, you will um, be suspicious of this chain and um, think that you are synchronizing to the wrong one. So the adversarial uh, chain will not be able to produce checkpoints, and that's kind of the, the core secu security argument, the core uh, theorem that we prove. And, for, and if you're attentive enough, you, the, you have this additional assumption that at maximum S stake moves within an epoch, and that's essentially to prevent kind of this exchange attack that I was describing. So if you can reroute uh, by censoring transactions, if you can reroute so much stake so that you end up with a lot of stake at the end, uh, you can make it so that you have more than two thirds. But if you Bind the, bound the number of stake that moves within an epoch, uh, you should not be able to do so. But of course, that will require... Um, so first, S is really, really large, and it's super unlikely that uh, any chain will, within an epoch, have like a sort of its stake moving. Um, but if you still anticipate this scenario, then um, you can potentially just end the epoch a little earlier and then start the next one. So what would be approaches to bounding as like do you envision that you would want to modify your protocol so that you could have it over bound on S or is it more just kind of empirical? Like you could just sort of see how much what S was in hindsight and then conclude what the security was. Uh, you're, you're Asking about how in practice will you pick? Yeah, like how would you get any control over S like in, in practice, yeah. Yeah, so in practice, I guess you will pick your assumptions with which you are comfortable, like how many Byzantine nodes you want to tolerate and how many sleepy nodes you accept. So you just think of it as like the same as F. Just yeah. And then, yeah, if you're kind of, your epoch starts approaching that S, you can just uh, stop producing new blocks within this epoch. Or maybe you can do something with transaction fees that they will climb up and kind of disincentivize people to submit more transactions. I think that's a good point. It's somehow like F may be hard to observe, right? And S, at least you can observe mm, right. from the blockchain. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, just to summarize the security theorem is saying that checkpoint and epochs cannot be forked. Uh, so we're kind of changing the assumption. We're making it a little better. Um, so before, we were relying on validators to stay honest, and either in perpetuity or staying honest and alert. And now we're changing that into users staying honest and alert. Uh, and the argument to Joe's point is that 
The validators are typically up to a thousand, sometimes up to two thousand, but in any case, it's not a super big uh, number. And all blockchain users can run from million to a billion. So usually, it's a much much bigger population, and you have much more keys protecting users' funds rather than kind of validating keys. I mean, the the pushback I would give you on this point is that. The number doesn't really matter. You care about the distribution, and there are like a Coinbase. I mean, has millions of those keys, right? Like there are like really concentrated places that have a lot of them. I mean, hopefully those are also places with really good security that are hard to compromise. But I guess it's not like the fact that the number is bigger doesn't make it obvious to me that it's harder to compromise enough of them. To comprise a majority of the stake. Yeah, yeah, great point. And so we were trying to study the distribution of these uh, keys and how much stake they uh, have. And I'll show you some graphs. That will hopefully. Ah, great. Um, <laughs> I'm like, I'm you're you're just talking. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's perfect. You're like ahead of the talk. <laughs> uh, so we, so the experiments that we carry, this paper of 2019, uh, this is. Pretty old, of course. It would be super nice if somebody redoes the experiments. I, I bet uh, the just overall dynamic of the cha chains um, have changed a lot in the last three years. Uh, but th that's the graphs um, from 2019 that I'm going to be showing you. So this graph shows the fraction of stake and the, how many keys are protecting that stake for Bitcoin, which is red on top, and Ethereum on the bottom. Um, so two thirds of stake, for example, in Bitcoin is protected by uh, 15,000 keys, and in Ethereum, only 800 keys. I don't know, maybe the numbers have changed drastically. I'm not sure, but that what was the state in 2019. And so it was really nice that kind of our paper was allowing flexible threshold thresholds, and you can kind of balance uh, your Byzantine assumptions with or whatever other bounds, uh, you, other things you have to bound. So you can go you can kind of raise your threshold um, from two thirds to something higher. And of course, if you go higher, for example, 90% uh, of the stake is protected in Bitcoin by 125,000 keys and Ethereum by 12,000 keys. Uh, and then if you go higher, of course, it starts climbing up very, really, really, really rapidly. But it would be nice to see what situation is now. Um, so of course, the more users um, stake votes, the higher is the assurance. So you would probably just analyze these graphs for your current blockchain and determine your threshold to make sure that uh, you have protection of more keys than your validator set. And then we're also analyzing Winkle's efficiency. So we were saying, OK, let's take Ethereum or Bitcoin and see how quickly will they be checkpointing if we have every user uh, vote on the latest available block. And these graphs are sort of indication of how frequently the stake is moving in the system. Because if stake is moving really, really fast, then you will have um, Time, time to checkpoint uh, to be really low if stake is idle and uh, it's not moving, it's not voting, um, then the time to checkpoint will be really high. And of course, in 2019, I don't know, people weren't transacting much at all. And uh, for example, for Ethereum, blocks were checkpointing about 200 days and for Bitcoin, about 600 days. So that's how much it takes for Two thirds of the of two third of the stake to move, but of course you can also add incentives. If you are to switch to Winkle and introduce Winkle, you'll have to maybe incentivize people to vote more frequently. So maybe they are not moving their funds, but at least they are a little bit more active on the blockchain. If you want to incentivize them to support the security of the blockchain, so that with incentives you can get these numbers to be lower. But without incentives, of course, these numbers are too high. Uh, you cannot afford your validators to stay honest for three years to get a checkpoint. That's too long. And so our idea was at that time uh, to introduce delegation. And you can, I guess, 
the argument here is that there are a lot of cold wallets there that are holding funds and they don't want to touch their keys at all, never, like they have it uh, stored somewhere securely and then only in kind of exceptional circumstances they want to pull it uh, out of the storage. So, but typically these cold wallets also have some warm or hot wallets that are transacting more frequently. So maybe just a cold wallet can designate a hot wallet to vote for it. Um, and so it would be natural to have this delegation mechanism where more idle accounts are delegating to more active accounts. Um, but of course, the argument is that uh, you now start adding back uh, the centralization. Um, but with proper economic incentives, you can make sure that your delegates are not growing to be too big. Like not everybody is delegating to Coinbase or something. So. Uh, you will incentivize people to redistribute uh, the delegation. But of course, if, we're, if we are to take the most uh, frequently transacting accounts and use that as our delegates, uh, then depending on the number of delegates that you get, that you have, um, the, uh, the time to checkpoint will drop significantly. So even for a million delegates, those are the most actively transacting accounts on Bitcoin and Ethereum, your time to checkpoint will be less than four days, which is, uh, which is great because you can afford probably to keep validator stake locked for four days and just keep them honest um, while being incentivized so that you're you have enough time to produce a checkpoint. Overall, what Winkle is doing is it's um, building on top of validator consensus layer where uh, you need to have two thirds of validators to vote. At most, one third can be Byzantine. Um, but that consensus layer is kind of complicated. It's interactive, it's <coughs> computationally intensive. The validators should run um, expensive nodes, should have some infrastructure, um, usually. So, and this consensus layer is safe while validators' keys stay secure. But uh, on top of that, you can add user-based uh, kind of consensus or checkpointing with flexible thresholds. You can uh, play with uh, the number of votes that you want to collect and the Byzantine threshold that you want to tolerate. And it's very simple for users. So it's non-interactive. The only thing they do is just they include an additional hash inside their transactions to vote on some epoch. Uh, yeah, and users don't need anything else, they don't need additional infrastructure. Probably each user has a good understanding of what is the current chain, because I would imagine users should be thinking with the chain once in a while, just to figure out how much money they have in their account or what's the current value is set, uh, so that they can verify the signatures on their transactions from the set and such. So users should already have some idea of what the state of the blockchain. So maybe it's not asking too much uh, for them to include this uh, hash of the epoch inside the transaction. And yeah, and this, uh, with this new layer, the whole blockchain stays secure as long as users' keys keep it secure. And arguably, it's like philosophically a better model. Maybe you don't have uh, just validators guarding the chain, but you also have the whole population of the blockchain kind of helping it to stay safe. Yeah, to summarize um, the main part, um, so we were discussing wrong range attacks and we were looking at different approaches to mitigate them. So checkpointing uh, is done in practice, but it's too centralized. Key evolving cryptography, I guess it's the best, it's a good practice for any blockchain to implement, um, but it's not incentive compatible. So if there are strong incentives to sell the key afterwards to the adversary, then you might not be honestly deleting your old keys, so that will not help. But that's definitely a good uh, still thing to have. Uh, keep everybody online seems like a recurring theme for protecting long range attacks because in Winkle also you have users kind of to check in what's the latest state of the blockchain. So in a way, they're also kind of keeping themselves online. Um, and we're also discussing finality gadgets that are helping the Nakamoto consensus to have deterministic finality that BFT gives. Of course, the time to finality will still be, uh, to, the time to deterministic finality will be very large for this um, 
combination of Nakamoto and Finality gadget. So, so it's not a way to kind of speed up Finality. To speed up Finality, you need to move to BFT. Uh, but that's a way to just um, make it deterministic instead of eventual. And then we discussed Winkle that kind of argues why it's, it's a good thing to maybe have a user-based consensus on top of your blockchain. Yeah, that's all I have. Um, and uh, I don't know, maybe we can discuss a little bit uh, if people have ideas uh, around what else can be done. So, uh, are, are people looking at BDFs at all to sort of help with long range attacks? Or? Yeah, I think they do. The problem is kind of with VDF, you can still uh, pre compute multiple forks of your VDF and then kind of keep one of the VDF forks secret, kind of with selfish mining approach, and then release it when you want to attack. So, Tim, are you suggesting the idea that like you can? You can tell a fork hasn't existed for very long because it doesn't have a long VDF computed on top of it. That's right. It's almost it's almost like using VDF as a proof of work surrogate, except it's sort of uh, certified. Well, it's not really a proof of work. It's like a it's a timestamp surrogate. Um, yeah, there there's a there's a paper that does a whole bunch of formal modeling about this. It's called like a computational timestamping. Um, I'm not sure anyone's seriously trying it, and I'm not sure it's a great idea just because the like the attacker's speed advantage kind of uh, over time will always be able to make their chain look longer than the honest chain if you assume that they have like some 2x speed up, you know, or some non-trivial speed up over the honest parties. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a it's a good theoretical idea that doesn't it's, it's not that attractive in practice. The other ideas are kind of a bit naive as well. Um, <laughs> of maybe you can keep rewarding old validators, give them a little bit of a diminishing reward, maybe to maintain security, to keep, just keep them incentivized. That's not a great solution. Or maybe you can do some kind of perpetual liquid staking so that their stake kind of continues to be subject to slashing forever, but you can still get some liquidity through liquid staking. But uh, I think maybe it's a... I also think... Uh... Yeah, true, definitely. Most of the projects just uh, uh, think they're going to solve it somehow with social consensus if this attack yeah. arises. Yeah, we are still to, to see how this works. <laughs> if it, but but just, I, I guess none of the existing proof of stake chains include anything in protocol designed explicitly to uh, protect against long range attacks. Is that right? Or, like you said, they all just are sort of implicitly assuming that it will be handled at the social layer if it ever happens. Yeah, it? most of them. Well, they had sort of mitigations, which is key evolving cryptography, checkpointing, but none of them is perfect. And, and you see that Winkle is also kind of, it, it, it kind of uh, makes your assumption weaker in that you now rely on the bigger population of keys, but it's not solving also. It. If, if all the past users have exited the chain for some reason and they have an incentive to sell their old keys, then um, you can also kind of fork user consensus as well. So definitely people are concerned and trying to figure out how to solve it and they just have mitigations, but none of them solves the problem completely. But in general, I'm struggling to have an opinion about whether this attack is based mostly theoretical or whether 
you know, it's the kind of thing where if it was theoretical, then I'd feel more comfortable with this idea that, oh, like, well, okay, we have this ad hoc backup of, like, you know, social checkpointing or something. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we thought it was, like, an inevitable sort of attack, then it then starts feeling like you might want more in protocol protections against it. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? Like, yeah, do, I had do you a thought. Ever see long range attacks? <laughs> yeah, I definitely had, like, a concrete thought for an attack. Just, I didn't, I didn't want to feed it to anybody to implement, but uh, oftentimes, for example, Ethereum consensus has access to validator keys. Uh, so yeah, your execution layer, because you need slashing to be done there, your execution layer has access to validator keys. And so in principle, somebody can write a smart contract that was, will be saying, you know, here is a bounty, and you can claim this bounty if you provide a secret key to the smart contract. Now you can not provide it in the clear, but you can encrypt it and you know, prove that it's correct. So you need some complicated cryptography to do that, but it's not impossible. And uh, you know, there's, such, there's some smart contract with a large bounty for collecting validator keys. You would imagine maybe validators will just use it, especially if they want to abuse the chain. Um, and that's a real threat, right? I don't know how they will be putting this contract down, for example. Like, so for this thing of like validators selling keys though, like wouldn't they then lose like any rewards they got like on the main chain? Like if an attacker like forks the chain or something, oh. why would you attack them? Like they also stand to lose from losing whatever things they've like done, right? Yeah, right. Well, yeah, you need to trust a little bit. Um, the, Maybe they've actually had to cash out on Coinbase or whatever. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You will have to trust the attacker to not attack during some window so that you have the time to cash out. Yeah. So yeah, there is some trust relation will be there. I think I think if you took like the Winkle stuff and you uh you did transactive fees for it, it might be interesting for combating kind of combat stuff is my so like the problem with is my obviously is like a short-term range attack in a way. Mm -hmm. It made me interested to see if I could talk with selfish mining in general. Ah, your idea of kind of waiting by transaction? Yeah, if you do a transaction fee, maybe you take the same idea of user submitting you know, a the, the, the last block hash they saw, they put that in a block with the transaction fee, then you pick the one with the, high, the heaviest fees, then maybe that could also help with selfish mining. Mm -hmm. Because now, as a selfish miner, I'd have to pay you know, equal or more transaction fees to beat them. Oh. So it's not just you know getting the work. It's not yeah. much, but it's not yeah. I see. Interesting. So you're saying the selfish miner will have to pay more? Yeah. Because in one five five nine, like the volunteers are the block producers are forced to pay a fee, and so you can use you know, that idea that you have to, there's a minimum payment to do selfish mining now. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. yeah, that's definitely an area uh, like direction to explore. It's transaction fees, I haven't thought about it much. Mm -hmm. Sounds good then. Um, well, send uh, any ideas if you get one <laughs> my way, and we can see if we can do something better here. Thanks. Cool.